Welcome to the Birth Lounge Podcast, an empowering space for expecting and new parents to hear candid conversations with experts to learn how to craft their ideal birth. You've got scary questions that you want to stop Googling, and we've got evidence-based answers with data to back it all up. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Birth Launch Podcast. You guys, today I have my friend Andrea from Instinctual Mothering on Instagram. So if you're not following her, go check her out. Um, uh, She is a lactation specialist and she does so much education on her Instagram, but I specifically wanted to have her on the show today to talk about boob, proofing, your birth plan. So there are so many things that we all want for our birth, right? We all have these birth plans and birth preferences, but what happens when... uh, our birth strays from our birth plan when we don't get to have all of our preferences and then we get into postpartum and realize that we had only really kind of planned for one type of birth or one type of postpartum experience and maybe that's not where you find yourself you're in this unexpected kind of unprepared territory because of something that might have happened in your birth. So Andrea, I'm so excited to have you on today. I'm really, really stoked to talk about how do the common interventions that we use in birth impact breastfeeding? What power do we have when we find ourselves in kind of an unprepared, maybe unexpected situation? And then what kind of tools do we have as nursing people to help us either make it easier or get us back on track or shift our goals from what they were to now what feels aligned to our family? So welcome to the show. Thanks. Um, So, yeah, I just feel like this is not really addressed, you know, with a lot of providers, breastfeeding is kind of seen as like an afterthought or not their responsibility. And it does have an impact on mothers. I mean, we see it all the time. Close to 90% of of moms want to want to breastfeed. Right. Um, So, and then they're affected when they can't or something goes wrong. So it's not the doctor's like responsibility anymore. He's like washed his hands of it right at that point. So we're not getting like the informed consent on the front end of these interventions to be like, well, you know, this might happen. And I'm not ever saying like, if you have an epidural or if you have a C-section, you can't breastfeed because that's kind of what like I (laughs) was made to believe when I was first pregnant. So that is not the case at all. I mean, I had an epidural, I had an intervention birth for my first birth. I breastfed my daughter for two and a half years. I mean, it's definitely possible. Right. But if you look at the actual like statistics, um, you know, we're seeing that these things definitely do, um, affect breastfeeding. You know, that's interesting to me because in the birth room, before people make decisions, a lot of times patients will ask, is this going to impact anything down the road? Is this going to impact breastfeeding? How is this going to impact my baby once they get here? And do you know that 99% of providers always go, no, there's nothing. No, it's not going to impact anything. No, you don't have to worry about anything. And it infuriates me because the truth is, exactly what you said. It does impact things and it's not good or bad. It is simply these people deserve to have that information so that they can go forth and make the choice that feels best aligned with them. And you can't truly make an informed choice if you don't know the repercussions down the road. So when we talk about common interventions, Pitocin, epidural, C-section, what are we seeing? How are these things impacting breastfeeding journeys? Yeah. So Okay, so let's we'll start with like an epidural because that's, you know, pretty much one of the most popular things. So the thing with, so the two main things we talk about with birth plans interrupting breastfeeding is separation and supplementation. Um, so with epidurals, well, one of the things is you get a bag of waters, obviously you get the IV, which can cause swelling to your breasts. Um, a lot of times like the big engorgement and, you know, when the milk comes in and like the edema, which is swelling, that can be kind of like compounded, um, your nipples can get really swollen and engorged, which is harder for the baby to latch on. Um, and then with epidurals, the baby can also be sedated. Now there, I looked up a couple studies, like the studies are mixed. Like some studies will say, Hey, this didn't you know, this didn't affect these group of mothers. And then some studies say, yes, it did. And 
the, I mean, research is flawed sometimes, especially because um, like they're counting, is the baby breastfeeding when they leave the hospital? They're not really, they're saying, oh yeah, the breastfeeding, cool, like bye. You know, they're not following up. Um, some studies do follow up like 12 weeks, six weeks. Um, I had found one that they followed up and they found no difference at 12 weeks. And then another study that found that the women were more likely to have stopped if they had an epidural um, at 12 weeks. Like there was less women who had the epidural breastfeeding at 12 weeks. So the studies are definitely mixed. Um, but if you think about like, I mean, anecdotally, I'm sure you've heard of women, you know, having traumatic birth, having these interventions and saying like, oh, you know, I was so tired, you know, I was injured, you know, or I had a tear and everything was just like so overwhelming. You know, anecdotally, I hear it all the time. Um, research is flawed for many, many reasons. Um, but we do see, you know, a good amount of studies talking about the epidural um, and the swelling. The baby could tend to be sleepier depending on what medication is in the epidural. Um, I did find a couple of studies saying like the higher the dose of like fentanyl in the epidural, if you have fentanyl in the epidural, the baby is more likely to be affected and maybe be a little sleepier. Um, and what about the narcotics and the impacts on your milk actually transitioning from colostrum to that breast milk? Is it going to delay that process? That's something that our team often hears is I think mm -hmm. my milk has taken a long time because I had an epidural or because I had an epidural for a long time. And anecdotally, we see the longer you had an epidural place, the more likely it is to impact that transition from colostrum to traditional breast milk. Well, like I said, before I said to you, like, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. So like, if you had Pitocin and then you had an epidural, you know, you are at risk for what's called delayed lactogen lactogenesis, which is like delayed of your second, like your full melt coming in. But um, if you're talking about just an epidural, I did find a study yesterday that said um, epidurals were related to delayed um, delayed milk coming in, but like studies are mixed, but a lot of times they're not, women aren't just getting the epidural um, because there's different things like hormonally that happen when you get an epidural, you kind of block those feel good hormones that oxytocin that's supposed to come to kind of block out the pain and block out your normal, normal hormonal response. So that kind of has to do with it too. But, um, if your baby is sleepy after birth because you had drugs, um, you know, it's okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Just try to stay calm. And this is where kind of like immediate support needs to come in for you, keeping your baby skin to skin, um, you know, not separate, like trying to delay that, like separating, um, do not bathe the baby, keeping the baby with mom, you know, as much as possible that's where that kind of comes in after the fact. If you notice your baby's a little sleepy from the drugs and labor um, or like with swelling, if you have swelling from a lot of IVs during labor, you can use like ice. Um, a lot of people like to recommend heat for engorgement, but actually to reduce swelling, ice is the better option. So those are kind of some of the things you could do if you have those effects after you get an epidural. Yeah, that's interesting. I just keep going back to the fact that providers always say like, no, it's not going to have an impact. And it, it just irks me so badly because it does have an impact and it's okay that it has an impact. It's just that people need to know. Can you imagine how much better people would be prepared if they knew they had an epidural and then once their baby got here, they also knew that their milk might take a little longer. We could just yeah. avoid so much mental rigmarole of like, oh my God, my body's not working. My baby is starving. My boobs aren't doing this. My milk's not coming in. I'm a failure. We could avoid all of that if people just went into it understanding, hey, I had an epidural for 20 hours. I may have delayed milk and I have other options, you know, to help. Or these are the things that I should be really cognizant of, not separating from my baby, yeah. not letting them wash my baby, doing tons of skin to skin skin. Um, super helpful. Okay. Anything Pitocin specifically related to, uh, breast milk? Yeah, this is kind of a big one because 
Um, I mean, you could dive really deep on like the differences between oxytocin and synthetic. And I was kind of nerding out to it um, the other day. But um, so what I found was the synthetic oxytocin doesn't actually reach your brain, I guess. It just goes straight to like the muscles down there. So in birth, in a normal like physiological birth, you have this like rush of hormones that goes through your brain that can actually like override the pain that you're feeling from these contractions. But with Pitocin, that's why everyone always says like, oh, the contractions hurt more with Pitocin. And that's kind of what like leads you into that like cascade because then you want an epidural. And so then, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's very rare to just just have one intervention. Um, So there's lots of like, I guess, differences between the synthetic Pitocin and regular oxytocin. So that's what kind of throws that off in the hormonal cascade, because then your body is not getting these messages that you're happy, you know, this rush of oxytocin when the baby's born and now it needs to produce milk. So that's kind of, that's also related to delayed milk coming in. Wow. Um, You know what that just makes me think of is that standard dose of Pitocin that we just give to everybody across the board, Mm -hmm. whether you truly need it or not, it just is like standard care that has got to be disrupting things, even Mm -hmm. though again, the hospital system will tell you no. And a few years ago, there was a couple studies that came out that said that small dose of Pitocin does impact things, but not on a very big level. And it makes me wonder how true are those studies? Yeah. One more thing that Pitocin could actually, because the, you know, you're more likely if you're going to have these painful contractions that don't go along with the, you know, the natural hormonal things that are supposed to happen in labor, like the woman feels stressed, right? Like birth interventions are are related to stress. They put stress on the mother. You might be stressed because you're having an induction, right? You know, you're stressed because of these hard contractions, you know, you're stressed, your birth plan's not going, you know, these, and it's actually putting stress on the baby too, since the contractions like make your uterus contract like harder and unnaturally. Uh, compared to the way that a natural contraction would. So that's like raising cortisol. And that also kind of affects like the stress hormones because cortisol is like, a it goes like, and what's it called? Antagonist to prolactin, yeah. which is the hormone that makes your milk, you know, abundant. So that's another thing that I was looking at with Pitocin. And like the recommendations like would be exactly the same as I said for an epidural, because usually they're, you know, they're together. In in. Yeah. So like, and like you said, it, it would reduce so much anxiety going into this. If moms are just told like, this isn't, this is a possibility. We need to get lactation in here. Like immediately we need a lot of skin to skin. Um, you know, make sure you're taking advantage of that. Cause what they call the golden hour after birth, it's a special time when baby is, is alert and like actually has these like instincts to latch on. Um, and then they go into this like sleep state like two or three hours later. So you, you kind of want to really prioritize that two to three hours when they're in that instinctual state to latch on. So if that were looked at, like, okay, this is a priority to this mom, you know, we're going to get help as soon as possible. Instead of, like you said, being just left in the dust and being like, yeah, it's fine. And then all of a sudden it's not coming in and the mom's stressing out and she has all this other pressure. And so, um, it would just be like such a difference if moms are just like informed about this stuff. You know, that Um, would require us retraining our hospital staff because how many people find themselves in the situation that you just talked about and they have a nurse that's right there going, Oh, it's okay. We can supplement. It's fine. Instead of saying, Hey, this is normal here's why you had an epidural for 23 hours. You had Pitocin for 17 of those hours. Um, That we know kind of makes your milk maybe a little bit late. Your baby can stay on your chest. You can do skin to skin. We don't have to wash them. Let's get lactation in here. If we had much more of a supportive hospital environment, I do. I agree. I think that it would just be so much smoother altogether. So 
can you talk to us about how that supplementation impacts things too when hospital staff are just like so yeah. eager to supplement even sometimes against the wishes of parents yeah look you were saying before like oh the hospital staff are just like oh no it'll be fine i'm just thinking like maybe it's cuz they don't even know realize it because a baby might let, like I said before, they're counting if breastfeeding is established in these studies. Yeah, sure. The baby's latching at 24, 48 hours. Then maybe the baby goes home. No one's like checking to see, you know, what's happening. Um, but yeah, so supplementation, uh, two of the things that moms are sometimes pressured to supplement over are either hypoglycemia, which is like low blood sugar or um, jaundice which is pretty common, which also Pitocin is also linked to jaundice. Um, so, I mean, like I said, it's all connected, but so a lot of times, something I found about hypoglycemia, which happened to me, and I was like, I thought I was like educated on birth. I wasn't as educated as I am now when I had my second baby, but I thought I was like, like good to go. Like, I know everything they're going to say. I know, I know all the comebacks, but I did not know about this. Like, uh, the sugar water and the supplementing, like they kind of just pulled out. He's going to have brain damage if you don't do this. Cause he has low blood sugar. Wow. So I was prepared for this, but I actually found that routine testing of babies for low blood sugar, um, that don't have any symptoms. They're just saying, Oh, cause my son was large for gestational age. And then I hear from some moms, their babies are small for gestational age. It's like, there's pulling reasons out of a hat. Oh, we need to test him. <laughs> you know what I mean? That testing without having symptoms is not actually evidence-based according to like WHO standards, but so you can decline the testing. I mean, that's in your right, but so they'll say, okay, we're going to test it. Like my son had to get his heel pricked, which is also like a stress response for the baby too. So you could definitely decline that sort of stuff. And then they don't like when they don't like the blood sugar. Sometimes they'll say we need to supplement with the sugar water, which is what happened to me, or we're going to move to formula, but some things that can happen. So when you supplement, it's really, really critical. The first like couple of days to have the baby on the breast as much as possible, because that's what brings in the milk. It's like, you're putting the orders in for the milk. So anything that kind of interrupts that process, that's why we say like separation is, is a big, you know, detriment to breastfeeding. So anything that interrupts that process. So when they feed the baby, you know, water or, or formula or anything, it's now the baby's full, he's going to come to the breast less often. And then the milk production kind of saying, okay, we don't need, we don't need this milk. So we're going to shut down. So, you know, alternatives to doing, doing the supplementation. I, I need to look into more about this, but a lot of people now are doing like antenatal expression of colostrum. Yeah. And I, it's safe for most people. You know, there's a couple of things that are contraindicated. I've seen like if you're having like repeat C-sections or possibly diabetic, I don't know. I need to do more research about it, but it is an option to have that. Someone who is at risk for preterm labor also yeah. should avoid it. Yeah. So like if you're at anything like where it's, you're going to have, like you have a incompetent cervix or something yeah. like but it's safe for, you know, most everyone else. And a lot of people are just, you know, collecting it in syringes, bring it, freezing it, bringing it to the hospital just to like, and that gives you just like this extra peace of mind, like literally in case anything happens and you're separated or you need to supplement, like, there you go. It's right yeah. there. Yeah. But, um, a lot of times with hypoglycemia, you can just, you know, keep breastfeeding as much as possible. And you could decline the testing, even if they're not symptomatic, if they are symptomatic, that's another story. But, um, same thing with jaundice. Um, I feel like jaundice is so, so common and actually physiological jaundice is, is just an extension of normal. There's a couple types of jaundice, um, but it's pretty normal in breastfed babies. And I think doctors are pretty like just fear mongery about it. And the problem with jaundice is like you're separated if your baby has to go under the lights for a long time and they're sleepy because you know they've got to get rid of that stuff water supplements are not evidence-based for jaundice so definitely decline those like it's not 
going to do anything because the baby just pees it out. It actually has to like go through the digestive system. Like yeah, the baby has to poop to get rid of the jaundice. So um, for jaundice, just if you can sit in a window, if you live somewhere sunny, um, indirect sunlight and tons and tons of breastfeeding, um, skin to skin as much as possible. And some hospitals have these things like billy blankets where it's like actual phototherapy lights that are people can actually bring them home i've never seen that but i know they exist and then some moms are saying like they have these billy boards where you can keep the baby next to you which obviously is not an option in every hospital but um it's just the separation when your baby is under the lights during that critical critical time period of like you know 24 to 48 hours 72 hours the baby needs to be like on the boob, especially if she has jaundice because she needs to be breastfeeding a lot. So, I mean, definitely if your baby has to go away under the lights, definitely bring her back every, at least every two hours, um, you know, tons of skin to skin. And, you know, again, that prenatal colostrum can also help. And I mean, if they ever want, if they ever suggest supplement, always ask about donor milk because it's always like the second choice. One of the most pivotal moments in my education point of learning about jaundice was um, from Dr. Jack Newman and okay. he talked about how bilirubin flushes out bilirubin. And so in order to get rid of jaundice, we need the bilirubin from the breast milk. And so when we separate yeah. these parents and formula is not going to have bilirubin. And so when we separate these parents, not only are these babies not getting the bilirubin in the breast milk, but we're also telling these parents' bodies that they don't need that much breast milk. And so then we have usually a low supply or some sort of disruption to milk supply. And it just is like a vicious cycle. That changed my whole life when it comes to thinking about jaundice and bilirubin and all of that. When you talk about um, bringing the baby to the boob every few hours pretty often, I want to clarify for our listeners, we're not talking about skin to skin and just like bringing your baby's face to your boob and letting them just like sleep on you. We're talking about truly waking up your baby, having yeah. them latch that saliva on your nipple is really important. We need like a true latch during those times. For babies who are sleepy and struggling to do that, Andrea, what are your suggestions? Are we is like five minutes enough? Is 10 minutes enough? Should we really be trying to stretch it to 20 minutes, even if everyone is kind of in tears? What's that look like if we're struggling to get a baby to latch often because of jaundice? Yeah, because sleepy. Well, definitely you want the baby like naked or diaper, skin to skin. Okay. Um, what I like for sleepy baby is breast compressions because part of the reason they're sleepy is because maybe the flow is not like you know, some moms, especially in the beginning, like the flow for colostrum is not going to be very forceful. So it just kind okay. of low sleep. So breast compressions can help. Um, Jack Newman has a really great video on it, actually. Um, kind of get more colostrum into their mouth and kind of like wake them up, switching sides constantly. So if they're, you know, they're falling asleep on one side, switch them over like multiple times. And it's not really about like the time period. Uh, that you're breastfeeding, you want like audible gulps kind of and swallows from the baby for, you know, a considerable amount of the feed. And if you're has baby, you have a baby with jaundice that's sleepy, you want them to be doing that like every hour. Like as long as you're doing it frequently, the time that you're doing it, like our brain is so wired to be like, okay, he's going to eat for 20 minutes every three hours when that's not like necessarily the case, like a bit sleepy baby with jaundice should really just be like hanging out next to your boob. Anytime they stir, pop them on the boob, yeah. breast them, try to get that like swallowing. And then if like, you're really not getting the intake that you want, that's where you move to, you know, maybe the frozen colostrum or something. But, um, like, yeah, a baby shouldn't be, it shouldn't really just be like chilling on the mom. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. anytime that makes a move, Boob. like, yeah. <laughs> Cause that's what flushes, like you said, the Billy Rubin out. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, I, I never see providers sharing this type of information with patients. It's always 
You've got to get your baby under the light. You can't hold them. We can't allow you to nurse them. They have to stay under the lights. You can't even have, you know, 20 or 30 minutes for a nursing session. You know, they have to stay under the lights. And obviously, uh, jaundice comes in varying levels, right? There are, are, there's, you know, very mild jaundice and then there's very severe jaundice. And I think that's a conversation to have with uh, your NICU team or your PEDS team or, or whoever your providers are at that time. But definitely know that you have options um, and, and certainly understand that that separation between you and your baby definitely is playing negatively in your journey. And so finding that happy medium of how do we get your baby that phototherapy um, or that the Billy Rubin treatments that they need medically and balancing that with keeping them skin to skin and getting you as many nursing sessions as possible is certainly, certainly worth the conversation and consideration. Um, and it's going to fall on you. Your, your providers are probably not going to have this conversation with you. They are probably not going to be encouraging you to come and do skin to skin. Again, they're probably going to be encouraging the opposite for you to just kind of let your baby be under the lights. And, um, you know, you come and visit them once or twice a day, but you are unlikely to be able to pick them up. I think it's really important for you to know that you have rights um, and there is a conversation to be had about this for sure. And you can pump, you know, if your baby is under the lights, you can be sitting there like pumping and with colostrum in the beginning, it's a lot, it might be a little bit easier to do hand expression than it is to use like an, or a hand pump than it is to use like an electric pump because it's so like thick and sticky. It's like really yeah. hard. Once you, it goes down into the pump, it's like all sticky all over the parts and then you don't get any. So looking up hand expression and even becoming familiar with it before you have the babies is a good idea yeah. and you hand express into like a little cup and then you know the baby can have it in a syringe you know if you're talking about like some serious you know more complex case with jaundice and needing to be under the lights so that's also something you can do yeah okay so one thing we haven't touched on is c-section how does this impact milk supply, nursing journeys, your postpartum, like it's, I feel like it should be a widely accepted thing. And I feel like among a lot of us, it's a widely accepted thing that C-section definitely impacts things on a much bigger level than what we have previously thought, what we traditionally lead parents to believe. Um, I think some medical providers are starting to come around to the idea, but for the most part, providers are still selling C-sections as like, it's yeah. just another way to have your baby. And it absolutely is. It's a shameless way to have your baby. You should not have any shame or guilt or any like big feelings about having a C-section, but you do need to know it does impact things on the other end. It is going to impact your milk supply. It is going to impact your journey uh, of nursing. It is going to impact your postpartum. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So obviously there'll be the same kind of effects if well, obviously you need an epidural for C-section. So you'll have like the same sort of effects on that. And if you had Pitocin, um, it's interesting though. I just found this study yesterday um, that, okay. So as far as like postpartum, it said that, so having a vaginal birth had like the lowest rates talking about like postpartum depression, having sure. a vaginal without assistance, which means like without forceps or vacuum had like the lowest rates, but next to that was the second lowest. And that was unplanned cesarean, not wow. like, a, not like emergency, like, oh my God, we're going in for a C-section. Um, the most rates of, of depression were emergency C-section um, and then planned C-section. Really, planned yeah. C-section has the worst impact out besides, of all of them besides, oh, emergency. besides emergency. So it goes vaginal delivery, unplanned, planned, emergency. Then, yeah. It makes sense that the emergency impacts it the most because yeah. you have that emotional component. You have that component of like, I feel felt like my life or my baby's life was in jeopardy. Um, yeah. So that definitely makes sense. That is so interesting. So I thought that was interesting because, you know, when we talk about postpartum depression and stuff, I just feel like mental health is such a big factor in breastfeeding these days. And so a lot of women are saying like, you know, it's not worth my mental health and kind of like blaming breastfeeding 
um but no one's talking about like the upstream like what happened upstream to cause the postpartum depression which led to ending breastfeeding because ending breastfeeding before you wanted to can make depression worse right so that I feel like when we're talking about birth interventions and breastfeeding is like a big conversation because you know mental health after after birth is like you know in the toilet and (laughs) in the U.S. so um that's definitely part of the conversation, but C-section. So again, the, the results in the studies are like mixed a little bit. Definitely, you know, emergency C-section has, you know, lower breastfeeding rates than something like a planned. Cause when you're planned, you, you know, you know, what's going to happen and you've kind of accepted it. Um, so you're going to have the same effects as far as like possibly, you know, delayed milk coming in um what's your experience with moms advocating for skin to skin in the OR yeah. like, do they hard? uh what is my experience my experience is that we always advocate for it and we rarely get it here's what I will say some providers will wrap your baby up in a swaddle bring them over put their cheek on your cheek and be like you're getting skin to skin <laughs> no, the hell I'm not. That is not skin to skin. That's not you honoring what I have asked. Um, and it's mm-hmm. not, you know, there is something definitely to be said about having a baby in an OR. You are in an operating room. You are having a major surgery. Absolutely. Some things have to be different than a vaginal delivery in the OR. But to say across the board that skin to skin is not possible or that you just can't do it is completely unacceptable in my book. I just don't think that any blanket statements like that are appropriate. And especially for something like a planned C-section, if it's not an emergency, if we're planning yeah. this out, Why can't we plan skin to skin as part of that? If it's unplanned and it's a non-emergency, that means we have the time to decide that the C-section is the right thing. We've tried other options. You probably are waiting a little bit to get in the OR. Why can't we plan for skin to skin to be part of that? And I find that a lot of times it's blamed on hospital policy, but it's also just blamed on, or I, I blame it on, Providers just not being willing to change and actually do something that is considered unusual. Like, well, this isn't what we usually do. Okay, great. I'm not usually in the OR. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's really upsetting to me because there's like a lot of research. And I used to think it was just some cute, like crunchy things that like, (laughs) you know, like some kitschy thing that mom wants to do after birth. Like, no, it's actually like really important. There's like a lot of research on how like other countries, some developing countries where they, they can't like afford incubators for the babies. They have like kangaroo care. Like that's how the babies grow. They literally have this like tube top. They strap the moms in and, and like the premature babies like go in the mom's like chest at all times. So it's actually like super important <laughs> to especially if you have a c-section because like I said you're missing that hormonal like cascade of the love hormones and that's what skin to skin does and it facilitates breastfeeding because it's the oxytocin um which makes you feel good and then the milk's letting down and then the baby's crawling over to your breast so I really wish that I mean maybe doctors will the more research comes out the more they'll make room for this um because, you know, I've had moms tell me that they said like, oh, well, the baby's going to be cold. Like, okay, well, can we get a blanket? Like, can we do the, you know, can we do all the testing when the baby's on mom? Like, what is the big deal? I just don't understand. Like, maybe can we make adaptations to make this happen because it's a priority? And the Um, answer is yes. Like we can make these adaptations. Yeah. Just the fact of being willing to do so. And that I think is the most infuriating part for me is we absolutely can make these accommodations. Hospital staff is almost always unwilling to. That's sad. Yeah, that is upsetting because definitely not evidence-based. Like if you were looking at the evidence, this would be like protocol. This would be like- Policy. Yeah, not 
not just some afterthought. This would be like a priority for moms um, because with the C-section, like I said, you really just miss it. That's like, you know, that's just the drawback of the C-section. You're just missing that hormonal cascade, especially if you're just going in, like you haven't had labor before. Yep. Um, that's what you're missing basically. And skin to skin kind of like makes that happen. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, like I said, the research is mixed on C-sections. Obviously, if you've had some dramatic, traumatic, emergency c-section it's not really just the c-section that could affect breastfeeding it's all these other things that we've already talked about and the trauma and you know the emotional stuff um you know in some of the studies i found like they found that yeah some studies are saying c-sections show a lower rate of breastfeeding at 12 weeks but when the mom is like super determined and advocating and educated and like makes it a priority like those differences disappear so that is wild. Okay. So I do want to circle back and maybe this is a great place to wrap up. Let's talk about that sticky place that you, you spoke about earlier about, I gave up breastfeeding because it was better for my mental health, but what if, oh. <laughs> what if you were never in that mental health space anyway, to begin with, because you had the better support through your birth, you had all your options, you truly knew the transparency between all or around all of your options, like having the conversation of, yes, an epidural may impact things. Here are some things after birth that we could do to make sure that we reduce those risks and still get you your epidural. I just think that would make such a big difference and help people avoid getting into that mental health place where they feel so lost and out of control and unsupported that the only control they really have oh. is not breastfeeding. No. And I never blame moms. Like, you know, I would never say like mom's too lazy to breastfeed. And that's yeah. why she's, you know, and it's like a sensitive topic and I get a lot of heat when I talk about it online, but like, um, so it kind of stems from like my own story because the, the reason I like to, I mean, I'm a former teacher, so, you know, I have a background in education. The reason I think like education and empowerment is so key is because like coming from that place of anxiety, like, you know, you just had this long birth, you know, you're overwhelmed. Like I had no idea how breastfeeding worked. Like, okay, it's just supposed to come out. Like, <laughs> like when you're educated, like, like you said, when you know, when you're informed and you know those options, you can reduce anxiety and have that feeling of control back. Because I think a lot of times with birth, it's like, you can have, a birth that doesn't go your way as far as like what you wanted. But if you felt like you were in control because you made informed decisions along the way, then like it could not be traumatic for you. And the same thing with breastfeeding. You know, if you're just feeling like things are just coming at you, you have no control over it. You have no idea how this works. You know, medical providers are just telling you your baby's going to starve and die. Like, yeah, that's pretty traumatic. Like I wouldn't want to deal with that either you know, if you were educated about like, okay, these are the things that could happen and here's what I can do to fix it or to help it. You know, some people get overwhelmed thinking like, here's all the things that could go wrong. You know, like, you know, I've been there, but if you, if you come back from a place of like, okay, here's what could happen and here are my options in case it happens, like you feel a little bit more in control. So you have like less anxiety about around it. So, I mean, control is an illusion, but we like to pretend that <laughs> we have a little bit, you know what I mean? Um, but like I said, a lot of times this mental health issues stems from other things, whether it be lack of support, you know, from the home, you know, from your family, from, you know, wherever, no maternity leave, um, or literally like physiologically, like from these birth interventions, like they play a role. You can't just say they don't play a role. Like they definitely play a role um, in your postpartum mental health. 
So what I like to focus on is saying like, it's not breastfeeding. That's the problem. It's like these other things that could lead, you know, to a a feeling of out of control and a feeling of like, I'm too overwhelmed. And this is just the easiest thing right now. And I would never blame a mom for making that decision. But I also like to advocate for things to be fixed down the line, because I know how like great breastfeeding is like, everyone's like, why do you care how other moms feed their kids? I'm like, but it's so awesome. Like you don't understand, like it's amazing. And then once you kind of like get the hang of breastfeeding and got that like feel good hormones going, like it actually is beneficial for your mental health because of the hormones. It's just kind of getting through that rough period. I always think about postpartum, um, that postpartum overwhelm as like a sinking boat and that water is constantly coming yeah. in. Breastfeeding is always right on top. And so when you're thinking about what to throw overboard to keep your boat from sinking, breastfeeding is yeah. one of the first things always to go. And it does make me just so sad that Breastfeeding isn't the issue. The issue is that we don't have the proper education beforehand. We don't have the proper in-home support. We don't have the proper parental leave. Um, Partners don't have the proper education. We have all of this generational air quote knowledge of, you know, moms and grandmas and mother-in-laws and neighbors and my cousins, you know, husband's wife, this, that, and this always has an opinion, but no one ever stops to say, Hey, what are your goals? What are your goals with breastfeeding? And how can I help you get there? in a way that makes you feel the best. It's always an opinion of, well, I did this and you were fine. Or like I did this and it worked out for me, or you shouldn't do that because this, that, and the other, and it's 30 year old advice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a sticky like thing to talk about because, you know, I'm definitely not ever saying you should be killing yourself over breastfeeding. Um, you know, I struggle with mental health myself. I like trying to troubleshoot with women to see what we can kind of fix upstream and what kind of like mindset hacks, you know, we can kind of put in place to kind of mitigate the mental stress. Yeah. Um, it's all just preventative measures, right? If we, if we can prevent you know, what is upstream that is causing these parents to feel out of control and overwhelmed, we, we may be able to avoid that sinking boat feeling altogether. Yeah. And the birth is definitely a piece of it. You know, it's like someone said like, oh, like giving birth is like running a marathon. I've heard that before, but like then breastfeeding is like climbing a mountain after running a marathon, <laughs> like, cause you're just already like behind the eight ball and stuff. If you you know, you have these interventions and you're exhausted and, you know, miss that special time. That's why, you know, educating before knowing what to expect is, is really important. And then being able to advocate for that, right. When they do try to take your baby say, no, I, I want to keep my baby skin to skin. When they do suggest supplementation, asking about, you know, what if I latch every 90 minutes? What are my other options? Can I get a lactation specialist in here? I don't want to do that because I want to reach out to Andrea on Instagram. Your nurses are going to roll your eyes at that, but you have the support, you guys. So Andrea, how can people get in touch with you if they wanted to work with you for boob proofing their birth plan, if they wanted to work with you um, one-on-one, or if they wanted to find you on social media and uh, gobble up all your your free yummy advice. Yeah, I'm on instinctual mothering on Instagram. Uh, I have a, a some free stuff. The boob proof your birth plan is free, and I have a free latch quiz, and I have some other digital stuff. But I do virtual like counseling sessions where I kind of do something similar, where I like gather all the evidence and like help you in your decision making around breastfeeding. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, but I'm working on a breastfeeding prep course because like I said, I do feel like the education on the front end is super important and I'm, I'm focusing and addressing on that mental health piece 
because I think it's missing in a lot of stuff. So yeah, hit me up on Instagram. Um, you know, my website's there, my email and everything. That is awesome. You know, breastfeeding, feeding your child, formula feeding, all of it is very controversial. Here's what I'll leave you with listeners. Find what works for you and then surround yourself with the people that support those ideas. It's, it's okay to bubble yourself off and not allow people to challenge your ideas right there in the beginning. It's really okay. You can bubble yourself off, find the people that support you, find the people who are going to help you achieve your goals, be flexible in uh, what your goals are, be okay changing those once your baby gets here, once we see what your body's doing, once we see what your birth turned out to be, you've got to be flexible, but that help is absolutely out there. Um, Know that you have options, but also know that you can 100% boob proof your birth plan. Andrea, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, absolutely. And listeners, I will see you next week. If you're interested in connecting with Andrea, we will link all of her stuff below as well as her link to the boob proof your birth plan. We'll see you next week, guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time on the Birth Knowledge Podcast. Until then, head over to Instagram and find us at Tranquility by Hehe and give us a follow. You can also check us out at thebirthlounge.com.